welcome to worship. My name is Chris McLean. It's my privilege to welcome you to worship at Shady Grove United Methodist Church, where I proudly serve as one of the pastors. A couple announcements as we get started. Uh, one, we want to direct you all to our website, which is a great resource to figure out the things that are happening in the life of Shady Grove. There are learning opportunities, connection and fellowship opportunities, uh, trivia night um, game type opportunities, things for children and youth, uh, support opportunities uh, for folks in all the many experiences that folks are going through at this time. And so I hope that you'll take advantage of those and know that you are welcome here. I do wanna highlight that in some upcoming classes, uh, Pastor Beanie Kelly is going to be leading an opportunity for folks to learn more about uh, questions around racism. Uh, that's a hard word uh, for people to work with and a hard conversation to have. Many of you might feel like, wow, you know, we really want to engage this work. And others might say, uh, have I done something wrong? Are people mad at me or after me for something? Um, and so there's a whole range of feelings in the midst of that. And I want to acknowledge that and let you know that all those feelings are safe feelings here. Maybe you've had some experiences where you felt as though you were mistreated in your life and you're wondering, are my experiences safe at Shady Grove? And you are. Uh, this is not a helpful time for shame, but it is a helpful time when we're dealing with clear pain. Uh, we see evidence of clear pain in our communities among all persons, our, among our police officers, among the black community, among persons of color, among white persons, um, all ages. We see experiences of pain, um, stories long held, stories that are new. Um, and we also see stories of amazing hope and possibility and gladness. Those stories are welcome here. Uh, and so I hope you know that's the spirit in which classes are offered. If you have concerns or questions, this is a place where you can work through it. But we do want to be a church that hears our community and the fullness of its questions and tries to offer being in God's presence and loving one another as God calls us to love each other as a place to work through those difficult questions. So if you have um, any concerns or questions about how to sign up for that opportunity, I hope that you'll contact our office or Frank Bass will be happy to help you. My friends, we are ready to begin our worship. Let us worship. <laughs>
So God welcomes us. God greets us with joy. And says, rest here for a while. God brings out water to wash our dusty feet. God prepares a meal to nourish our weary spirits. So let us receive the gracious hospitality of our God. Let us rest in this holy place. Where there is shade and water. Food and laughter. Let, let us, us worship, worship God. God. Let us join together in our opening prayer. The words can be found at the bottom of your screen. Lord God, come to us in all your delightful difference and thick complexity. Come to us as lover, beloved, and the loving. Come to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Save us from our futile attempts to try to tame your immensity, to worship you as less than you are. Enable us to grow up toward you, rather than to try to shrink you down to our limits. Come to us, we pray, so that we might come to you as you are. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining me this morning for the children's moment. I'm so glad you're here. This is Pumpkin. Pumpkin's an important member of my family. He's 17 years old. That would be like a person who is 84 years old, probably the age of your parents' parents, your great-grandparents. What if I were to tell you, what would you say if I told you that pumpkin can put stars in the sky? You'd say, that's impossible. What would you say if I told you that pumpkin can walk on water? You'd say, that's impossible. What would you say if I told you pumpkin send it, can send angels to bring messages? You'd say, that's impossible. What would you say if I told you pumpkin can have a baby? You'd say, that's impossible, right? Well, you are right. Pumpkin cannot put stars in the sky or walk on water or send angels with messages or have a baby. But the Bible has lots of stories about someone that can do all those things. Do you know who that is? You're right, it's God. God told Abraham to count the stars in the sky. And Abraham said there were millions of stars and he could not count them all. God made a promise to Abraham that like there are millions of stars in the sky, he would have millions of children that would call him father. You may know the song about Father Abraham having many sons. Well, this is the Abraham that it comes from. Well, Abraham and his wife Sarah became very old, like my pumpkin, and still had not even had one baby yet. But Abraham kept his faith strong and believed that God has not forgotten his promise. One day, three visitors, maybe angels, came to Abraham and said that he and Sarah would have a baby by the next year. Well, Sarah could not believe it. She laughed. She thought that she was way too old to have a baby. But the visitors or the angel said, is there anything too wonderful or too impossible for God? And by the next year, Sarah really did have a baby. They named the baby Isaac, which means laughter. Sarah learned that nothing is too impossible for God. Abraham and Sarah's family became very large. They had many grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren and so on. Their family became so large that a whole nation was started. The people of Israel, the Jews, came from Abraham and Isaac's descendants. The people of Israel were a blessing to the entire world because thousands of years later, another descendant was born, and that was Jesus. 
And this is how Abraham became known as Father Abraham. God always keeps his promises. And God is the one who can do the impossible through us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for keeping your promises. Please help us keep our faith strong. And remember that you are the one who can do the impossible within us and our families. Amen. morning scripture reading is from the book of Genesis chapter 18 verses 1 through 15 and chapter 21 verses 1 through 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and he bowed low to the ground. He said if I have found favor in your eyes my Lord do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat, so you can be refreshed, and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent of Sarah. Quick, he said, get three seahs of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. He then ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. 
Abraham and Sarah were already very old and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did laugh. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. As she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. People ask me all the time, Michael, what was your big break? Our next guest has performed on Comedy Central's Premium Blend. He made his first appearance on The Tonight Show from Montreal Comedy Festival. You've seen him on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. That wasn't a big break. The big break was at a club. And right before I got on stage, I had a change in mindset about comedy. Normally when a comedian gets on stage, he wants to get laughs from people. And I felt a little shift take place where I felt like I was to go up there and give them an opportunity to laugh. Now I'm not looking to take, I'm looking for an opportunity to give. This changed everything. My name is Michael Jr. I'm gonna do some jokes. And ultrasounds come in color now, which is ridiculous. I know it's a black baby. It better be a black baby. I leave the club that night, and there's all these people giving me hugs and high fives, telling me their favorite jokes. Then I look across the street, and I saw a homeless guy. And I thought to myself, what about him? Most comedy, most jokes are set up. My son, four years old, looks at me out of nowhere, and he says, Dad, I want to be a doctor. I was like, yes, yes. And then a punchline. Then he said, or a dinosaur. <laughs> I understand that me doing comedy and doing all of these TV shows and making all these people laugh is really just a setup. My punchline is to make laughter commonplace in uncommon places. We go to Montrose, Colorado, a place called the Dolphin House. They take care of children who have been abused by their parents. And this grandmother explains to me that her um, grandson is being abused by his mom. He's so afraid of his mom that everywhere he goes, he wears a Spider-Man costume. So I get on stage, sitting right up front, Spider-Man. I start doing comedy. People start laughing, slowly but surely. Probably about 25 minutes into it, I hear a voice. And the voice says, my name is Ronan. And this little boy pulls off his mask. And it was one of the most powerful moments in my entire comedy career. Here's the deal. If we could just stop asking the question, what could I get for myself? and start asking the question, what can I give from myself? I think people would learn that you don't have to be a comedian to deliver a punchline. It's really what I want to get across to people. And I think I just did. I looked at the camera again. I don't know if I was supposed to do that. Emphasis. <laughs> Anything else you can think of? Yeah, I'm going to say it right now. You've been set up. You in the setup. Be the punchline. Okay, I'm gonna walk off dramatically. <laughs> Friends, let us prepare ourselves to hear what God would say to us today. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of the cross. 
for the work of your son, Jesus, to reconcile all of creation to you. And so God, in gratitude for that work, for that cross, we pray that you would hide me behind the cross so that all would see less and less of me and more and more of thee. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, we continue our series called Family Reunion, and the message this morning is God's imperfect family. Does that sound like you? God's imperfect family. I think it sounds like all of us together. So I want to start with a story about a family. Uh, it's a family uh, whose story began in marriage, and each one of these partners in the marriage came from big families themselves. And so the husband had eight to ten siblings. I can't remember just how many. And the wife had about 12 siblings. I can't remember just how many, but together, people thought, wow, with these two together from such big families, they're going to have 50 kids. And so the family rejoiced, this gigantic family rejoiced when these two were married and all the joy that was yet to come. And they saw in this couple that they were fun and nurturing and energetic. They couldn't have been more excited for the future. And then around baby news, nothing seemed to be happening. And family started making, you know, those little comments, hey, when am I going to be a grandma? Are you thinking about kids? You think a baby's on the way? And they'd say, no, uh, we're not sure, and kind of push the conversation off. And then years went by, and still nothing happened. And after a while, the family members began to get restless in their comments, and they began to say things like, wow, don't you think it's selfish of you? You are such great people, you two. You'd make such wonderful parents. We can't believe you're not having kids. Come on. And years went by and nothing. And finally, when they'd almost given up, they had one child and channeled great love and energy into this child. My friends, there's a side to this story that this big family didn't know. And it's what the couple was going through all those years. They had no idea that during those years when they were making all those comments, hey, have a baby, when am I going to be a grandma, that the couple had been experiencing miscarriage after miscarriage and great seasons of infertility. They kept that pain to themselves. And so I do want us to pause right there and be mindful of all those struggling with infertility and the longing for a family. Thank you for that pause. I want to lift up infertility because it's a big part of what we find in our scripture this morning. It's Sarah's story. Now, I don't know exactly what Sarah's life goals were, but there is evidence in the scripture that part of her life goal included having a child and that God's plan for her to be mother of a great nation, that was God's promise to Abraham that you and Sarah are going to be parents of a great nation. And through that family, imperfect though it may be, through that family, we're going to touch the whole world for the purposes of reconciliation. And so if God wanted her to have a baby and she wanted to have a baby, surely she was on the way to having a baby. But years went by and nothing happened. One day in particular, three strangers showed up. And if we read the biblical account, we'll see that one minute it's talking about three men and the next minute it says God, that somehow these three men are representing God. There's mystery there. But Sarah, she overhears a conversation between the three men and her husband, Abraham. And in that conversation, she hears the words, when we come back this way, Sarah will have a child. Now, like that first couple I told you about, Sarah knew the backstory, what was behind all those years of nothing happening. And part of what happened is she just aged 
and got past that point of fertility. And her response, she snickers and says, well, I at last have pleasure. And that word indicates that she and Abraham were not in an intimate season in their lives together. And so she hears this and all she can do is laugh. So there are different kinds of laughter. Uh, we began with a video from a comedian named Michael, and Michael understands so much the laughter of a good joke. And the laughter becomes something he doesn't want to get, but something he wants to give. And when you give that gift of laughter, think about when you were really able to laugh. I mean, not laugh at something negative happening, but just laugh in a free and truly positive way. That key word there is freedom. When were you free to laugh? to have great joy. So that's one kind of laughter. But sometimes when we laugh, there's a wryness to it. And we say things like, well, you might as well laugh as cry when something is just so difficult. You don't have any more tears left for it, no more serious words, and you just throw your hands up. And when Sarah laughs, she laughs this laugh of disbelief, of skepticism. When we're dealing with God's promises, and in this case, the promise was Sarah will have a son. When we're dealing with God's promises and we laugh at the promise, not because it brings us joy and freedom, but because we just can't believe it. We know that we're in a place where we're questioning God and questioning the power of God's promises. So, Let's work with that phrase a little bit. I had a pastor friend of mine who used to talk about God's promises, and he really got that phrase into me. But early on, I used to think, gosh, what's he referring to specifically? I wish he'd give us a quick list. What's God promising right now? And we can find one of God's promises in Genesis. It talks about um, the rainbow, that God puts a rainbow, and that symbolizes God's promise to never destroy the earth again. And so during this time of coronavirus, uh, Frank in the office put on the church bulletin board uh, the rainbow and that promise that we can trust God to be caring for the world. Uh, and so that story of the rainbow after that time of flood that we see in the Bible, that is a promise. Another promise can be found in the prophet Isaiah. You'll remember probably at Christmas season, you hear that scripture that talks about how the lion will lay down with the lamb. And so something about this striving and this threat of survival of the fittest, that that is going to change. We hear from Jesus in the Gospels where Jesus says, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. That's a promise. You don't walk alone. Or we can see promises in Jesus's actions. When Jesus feeds thousands, has people sit down in the grass and pulls just a little bit of fish and bread and, and somehow it's enough for thousands. There's a promise there that we don't need to be afraid of not having enough. Our concern is to share, share of what we have and trust God for the abundance. That's part of the hope and promise we find at the communion table. You find a promise in the letters that Paul wrote that's in the back part of your Bible in the New Testament. And one of the things Paul says is that in Christ, in Jesus, we are not anymore Jew or Greek. We are not slave or free. We are not male or female, but we are one in this body of Christ. And what a hopeful word, a word of unity that we can discover in Christ in a time when we're seeing the great pain of disunity and uh, people just feeling alienated from one another. What an amazing promise. At the very end of the Bible, we think it's the end of the Bible, but it's really pointing into the future where the story continues in our lives. And the future that Revelation points to is a time when every tear will be wiped away. You may find yourself going through a lot of grief right now because we've been through so many difficult things, one right after the other. And there's some grieving to be done there. All tears will be wiped away. The Bible is full of God's promises. It would be difficult to, to agree exactly on a number of them. But as we study and move in God's word, we begin to discover more of who God is 
Who is this God that Jesus knows? That's how James Bryan Smith talks about it. And what is this God calling out and promising? What is this God's vision? And so when we talk about God's promises, we're talking about God's vision and what God is doing to make that vision reality and that we can count on it. And in this story, we see God's promise in laughter. Sarah is laughing this wry laugh of disbelief and God's letting her know, you will have this joy. You will have laughter, I promise you. God's promises matter because we can count on them. Friends, there are so many times in our lives where we need something to hold us steady because we feel like we are spinning out of control. There are times when we don't know where to find hope or times where we begin to suspect that we have put our hope in the wrong thing, place. And so God's promises they are what we can absolutely count on because God is good, God is trustworthy, and God loves. And so we can trust God. Now, there's some things that these promises are not. These promises are not individualistic. It's not a promise that I'm definitely going to have this job or this pay bracket or this kind of house or this car. It's not that kind of stuff. It's not that I will get this particular accolade. It's not any of that. What we do see is a promise that there are many gifts in one spirit, that we look around in the community, the human community around us, and we see gift after gift that God has given, and that God is calling all those gifts together in one mission to reach out. It's God's mission, and we embody it by loving our neighbors, loving our enemies, by loving as God loves. So there's nothing individualistic in this. The thing we might notice about God's promises as I'm talking about them is, wow, you know, Pastor Chris, this sounds really abstract. Um, this great healing of the entire universe that God is working. It's so huge. Don't you think it would be easier to find the ends of the rainbow than to participate in this abstract wonderness that is God's promise? But friends, we know we can do this. We know that we can live abstract, beautiful ideals in our real life. We know just what that looks like because listening is an ideal. And we know that there have been times where we have been listened to and times that we have listened. We know what love looks like lived in the world. We know healing when we see it. We know hope when we see it, right? And so, there is a way to live these big abstract ideals. We know them when we see them. And we know that these things are the things that set us free to truly laugh. So in this promise, in this purpose, what Michael said when he was talking about this comedy, we find that God is giving us a setup for the punchline that's uniquely ours. God is giving us the opportunity to find how we can uniquely give into the promises that God will make happen in our lives. God will bring laughter in and through us. So as we wonder, what, what could we possibly give into God's promise? We find ourselves in Sarah's shoes. So just go on and imagine that you're Sarah and some guests come to your home and you overhear this conversation that says how you, you in particular, are going to give something of great importance into the work that God is doing. How do you react to that? There are a couple of ways where we might just sort of have some mini crises right off the bat. Uh, the first one might be, wow, it sounds like you have some big plans for my life, God, but I, I have plans, right? The second is maybe the idea that um, I don't feel qualified for those plans. That's Sarah's story. She doesn't feel like it's in her personal wheelhouse anymore. She's not prime for this mission anymore, and neither is her husband next to her. I mean, it's not meant to be judgmental. It's just, they're just people, and they just haven't been living with one another that way, and they just feel like they're past their prime for this promise. They don't see the promise that God is talking about as a realistic one. God might as well have asked Sarah to grow up and become a dinosaur. Third, when we have been for many years pursuing 
something we thought God meant for us to do. And we have a few good moments, but overall we have the sense that nothing is happening. When we hear this conversation about how God's going to use us and we haven't felt fruitful so far, how can we not laugh that heavy laugh that Sarah had? Sarah laughed that way and she was overheard and so she gets called on the carpet and God asks, why did you laugh? Why did you laugh? And then Sarah gets these nine months, the scripture calls it in due time, in due time. She has this time not to better up her life plan, but instead to open herself up to the impossible joy of God's plan. God gave Sarah and Abraham a role in healing the world. He might as well have asked them to become dinosaurs, but nine months later, this promise is not just possible, it's happening. She has Isaac, and the name Isaac means laughter. And so picture the joy and the freedom she had in naming her son, Yitzhak, Isaac. God set her up to bring laughter into an impossible and uncommon place. And that's how God is with us, too. So we're talking about laughter, but you and I know that there's not a whole lot funny going on in our world right now. We don't feel like we're just abiding in this free and healing laughter. It's hard for us to go out of our houses. We might not be in Spider-Man costumes, right? But we're wearing masks, literally. We see our communities in pain. How do we bring God's laughter into our time? So I have an action list for you. Uh, this is a community that likes to take action. So good time to maybe write these down and work on them over the next couple of weeks. One is learn. Learn about this God that Jesus knows. That's how James Bryan Smith talks about it. So if you want to get started on that, there's a great book um, by James Bryan Smith, The Good and Beautiful God. It will help you learn about who is the God that Jesus knows. Not what do you think about God, but who is the God that Jesus knows, because that's guiding for us. You will find the learning about the God Jesus knows in the Gospels. Those are the first four books of the New Testament. And so learn about the God that Jesus knows. This God is good, loving, just, forgiving, healing, reconciling. This God makes new, brings laughter in uncommon places. Two, if you learn God's promises, then take God's promises seriously. That's what we see Jesus do. How do you go about that? One way, yes, is to study the Bible, but this is where being in a, in a Christian fellowship group or in a Bible class is really helpful because in the context of that class, as you're talking with others, you're able to get an increasing handle on how God is bringing those promises to bear. You might see something amazing happen in someone else's life, and then you say, oh, what, well, something like that's kind of happened to me. That's what you mean when you say you see God in it? Well, maybe God is at work in my life. And so that kind of conversation really happens as we encourage and help one another in community. So I encourage you to take that time. It takes time to learn these promises. Think of Sarah. She didn't have the sense that it was all going to work. She heard God's promises and all she heard was impossible. That change of perception is one that happens in due time. So take the due time with those promises. Learn them and then step two, take them seriously. Step three, as you are hearing these promises, hold up life before these promises. What do you know of life? And then there's what you know about it. And then there's what your neighbor knows and another neighbor and that stranger. And we all seem to know something different about life. And we spend a ridiculous amount of time arguing about it, screaming to be heard the most. So it's like that proverbial elephant. Life is so big. We need the humility to acknowledge how big life is. And understand that we're all standing somewhere different around this elephant. And this one is describing it. And it sounds like the tail. And this one says, no, it's all about a trunk. It really is all part of a story. It matters if we hear one another. Sarah needed Abraham. We need each other to help us understand what this life is and hold this life up against God's promise. Step four, 
As we hold reality next to God's dream, God's promise, notice. Notice if it makes you laugh. You hear about the call to unity. Does it make you laugh? Because you might as well laugh as cry. As you hold reality next to God's promise, notice if you laugh, notice where you laugh. Not just about um, racism, not just about health, but about countless things where we need to hear one another and hear God's promise at work amongst us all. Where do you find yourself laughing and is it the laugh of skepticism? Friend, do you hear God ask you, why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Is anything impossible with God? And then do what Sarah said and take due time. Allow that skepticism to come out in your relationship with God. Keep acknowledging reality around you and doing the work together with God. Trusting in God to hold you steady as you do this disconcerting work. And allow God to work on your perception about what kind of promise really is possible. And then act. That's the final step. We are God's imperfect family. It's funny and wonderful that God can use us, but it's going to take some things. It's going to take courage. It will take courage and confession. I heard a fellow clergy person say this week that, that they try to stay in a place of confession because otherwise they'd get defensive. They defend all the reasons they think God's promises can't come true. And so... The person tries to stick with courage and confession in order to discover what God can do, face what God can do, face the need of it, engage those needs, and do what God would do in the face of those needs. I've never met anybody yet who wouldn't benefit from that advice to allow oneself to confess in order to be forgiven and to grow. So I just lift that up to you. It's so helpful to me. So what were those steps? Learn God's promises. Step two, learn and take them seriously. Third, then hold life against those promises. And as you hold reality next to God's dream, notice if and where you laugh and let God talk to you about your laughter and your skepticism and let God grow hope in you so that you can act in hope so that you can find how God is trying to use you. Friends, we all have times in which we might as well laugh as cry. God is the giver of great and healing and freeing laughter that wipes away, the one who wipes away those tears and lets us have that new kind of laugh, a creation made whole in joy. That's God's promise. And it's the promise that God is calling us to be a part of. God is calling you. Why are you laughing? Nothing's impossible with God. Amen.
not change, your promise is true. Faithful God, we lift up one voice, and we make a choice, we put our trust in you. The prayer of the people for the children of God. Let us pray together for the church, the world, and for all God's children. Please join in the prayer by responding with the words on your screen during each pause. For all the children in the world, for the eternal and endurance child in all people, and for the childlikeness which grasps your truth and to which we are called. For each child that you have given into our care in the ministry of Shady Grove United Methodist Church for their gift, talents, and love, and the privilege of sharing with them the journey of faith. For all those who share their time with children to guide and learn from them, for parents, teachers, and volunteers who work grace us all. For the gift of holy baptism through which we are all born anew and by which you give us young and old to be sisters and brothers to each other. We lift up to you the needs of all children everywhere, for those who are hungry and afflicted by war, for those who are sick with AIDS, cancer, and other diseases, for runaways and for refugees, for victims of abuse and neglect, for those who prevent in any way from realizing their growth, abundance, and freedom that is their birthright. To all organizations that work for the well-being of children, especially United Methodist Family Services, Caritops, STEPS, Social Services, and foster agencies. To all those in authority who make decisions for the world's children to presidents, rulers, and legislators. To each of us charged with stewardship of our environment that the children of the future might have fresh air and clean water. Gracious and everlasting God, whom child Jesus show us how full is our heart with love towards us all. Grant that we, like him, may take to your call to live and walk in that love and to rest and play and work with the freedom of children and always on their behalf through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thou kingdom come. Thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
you know, friends, that even now we have something to laugh about, to skip and laugh and play because we can trust in God's promises. Sometimes it seems as though they work out painfully and slowly through us, God's imperfect family, but God is faithful. We are not alone and nothing is impossible for God. So smile and laugh and give the gift of laughter. Amen.